Good day, everyone. I'm Bob Ackerman, the Editor-in-Chief of Signal Magazine. I'm pleased to introduce a discussion about the use of big data and intelligence. Simply put, the issue is whether big data is the way ahead for intelligence. Presenting their opposing views are Lewis Shepard, Director and General Manager of the Microsoft Institute, and Mark Lowenthal, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Intelligence and Security Academy. Lewis, you're a proponent of a role for big data intelligence, so why don't you tell us why? Thank you, Bob. Uh, I don't believe my position should actually be that controversial, particularly since it's been underlined through the entire history of the intelligence community. The United States intelligence community, when it was founded in 1942 by Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, at the early in the early days of World War II and establishing the coordinator of information position, uh, a predecessor of the OSS and, of course, of CIA, uh, the charge was very simple, and I think these words actually are relevant today. Uh, it was directing the new coordinator of information to collect and analyze all information and data which may bear upon the national security of the United States. We're still trying to fulfill that pledge of collecting and analyzing all data which may be relevant to intelligence and national security. And that's really our challenge today in a time when our ability to generate data uh, has exponentially grown so dramatically, uh, particularly in the Silicon era. So uh, for the intelligence community to do anything other than to have a vast appetite uh, to collect, and a uh, world-beating capability to analyze uh, essentially all of the data, which is practical. Uh, doing anything else and having the appetite to do anything else really would be a dereliction of duty for the IC. Mark, you may take issue with some of Lewis's points. I don't argue with Lewis's history about how the community was founded. I don't argue with the idea that intelligence depends on data. Where I depart from my colleagues is the following. The current hype and emphasis on big data has almost nothing to do with how intelligence is actually done. It has nothing to do with the reality of the data that are available. And most of the hype that you see isn't coming from analysts. It certainly isn't coming from policymakers who will tell you to your face, I don't want data. It's coming from people who make their money processing data. It comes from IT people. And it's built on an interesting intellectual fallacy, what I call the X-Files fallacy, that the truth is out there. If I just parse enough data, and if I just move it back and forth enough, I will get the right answer. And for a lot of the stuff that is most central to policymakers, intentions, it ain't about data. No amount of data in the world will tell us what Kim Jong-un is going to do next. No amount of data in the world is going to tell us whether or not pressure on Assad is going to change his mind. Now, data are useful. If you're doing economics, I used to be in the missile business, we use data. But a lot of this is hype, and that's my real concern, is that we are hyping this one attribute. This is a solution in search of a problem, and it's leading us to ignore much more core fundamental capabilities, like the building of knowledge, and data ain't knowledge. Gentlemen, I'm sure you'd like to elaborate a bit on your views. Please feel free to. Well, uh, Mark, I'm, I'm tempted to say, Mark, you ignorant slut from the old Saturday Night Live uh, uh, yeah. classics. The, uh, I, I think the real uh, difference of opinion that we probably have is about what the intelligence community is supposed to be doing. And the real answer is it's supposed to be doing a number of things. And so uh, the importance, relative importance, of collecting and analyzing large amounts of data is going to be a relative importance. It's going to be relatively more important to focus on uh, uh, a kind of universal uh, appetite for vast amounts of data in areas of the intelligence community where it's supporting tactical and uh, tactical and mission-oriented uses of data. Uh, we've certainly found that over the last 10 years of war on the defense intelligence side of the community, and also for warning 
and uh, and related kinds of strategic intelligence. Uh, perhaps it is less relevant and therefore um, of less value to focus on big data collection or analysis in areas of uh, intelligence analysis which are uh, more reliant on uh, gauging the intention of individual state actors or individual um, uh, power players within foreign countries. Uh, but you have to remember that some of our largest intelligence problems or failures have not been about misjudging or missing the intention of a Kim Jong-un or any other foreign leader but about mischaracterizing and misunderstanding what the foreign nation was actually doing. I would posit that's instead... Not, that's not data-driven, if, if oh, I may. It actually Our is. Pearl Harbor is not a data-driven decision. The capabilities of the Japanese fleet are known down to the last airplane. The fact that Japan has decided, oh, let's just throw the dice on Sunday after more, Sunday morning and do it is not a data question. You know, for a year, I spent years in the Soviet missile business. We knew the capabilities of the Soviet Union down to the last forehead. What we really worried about were intentions. Would they, wouldn't they? And that's not about data. Data are useful. Certainly for my friends at SAC, as it then was, doing planning. My friends at DIA doing it. Yes, they need data. But when you come down to really core national level questions, you've left data behind. Again, I'm not saying we don't need data. What I'm saying is that the emphasis on it and the overemphasis on it is causing us to skew invest and concerns about where we put our analysts and how we use them. So let's look at a couple of these examples that you've cited. For example, uh, the 1970s, 80s intelligence, I would submit, and I was a, a young Soviet analyst uh, in the mid-80s uh, in the Pentagon, I would submit that the intelligence community actually mischaracterized the capabilities of the Soviet military and the Soviet nation state and its allies fundamentally that, uh, you know, I think Team A was actually right and Team B was wrong. If we look in retrospect at what we discovered, uh, both in the waning days of the Cold War and certainly after, retrospectively, about what the actual true capabilities of the Soviet military machine were and the ability of the Soviet nation to support any kind of uh, actual national action or military action against uh, the United States and its interests, we were vastly overestimating, vastly misunderstanding what uh, data actually could have told us had we uh, adequately collected. There's, and, there's, and that's a really interesting case. If, let, me, let me jump in for a second because I know we're time, time sensitive here. All right, I was a Soviet analyst at the same time. Yeah. And there was a case where we didn't actually have the data. What data we had misled us but nobody had good data we on agree. the Soviet economy, including the Soviets. That was their problem. But but we knew that we knew the military, and the military was fairly capable. They could have leveled this country. We could have leveled their country. But we didn't have the data that we needed to tell us. Oh my God, they're dang game. You know, let me tell you a data story, a fast one. I stole one of your analysts from DIA to come work for me at INR. He doubled his estimate of Soviet spending on defense, and I said, "What am I supposed to do with this data?" The Secretary of State is not going to believe it because you've just doubled your estimate. And he's going to just say, this isn't meaningful to me. What do I do with the president? So the memo died because it wasn't something you could get their arms around. So we, we had insufficient data, but so did everybody else. Was the data didn't exist. So we made really good decisions in the absence of data. I, I, I think what you're pointing out is that we agree on... Um the desirability for the community to have more and better data, more accurate data. Yes. I think, for example, in characterizing the economic capabilities of, uh, of adversaries and allies alike, we have vastly more powerful ways of uh, collecting, categorizing, and analyzing uh, the economic capabilities and activities of adversaries and allies alike uh, today, through technological means, than we had in in those days when you and I were using typewriters, and that's that's a good thing. So we agree that we can and should be collecting more data, relevant data, and I think that uh, today, when we consider the vast amount of data that's available, we actually do need technological means to filter, sort, categorize. 
and tease out the relevant aspects of data. The other example that you cited of assessing whether or not um, uh, a foreign adversary might have nuclear weapons. Let me ask you, uh, you know, in terms of judging um, whether or not Iran has a nuclear weapon or more than one today, is that actually a, uh, uh, a cut and dried um, assessment of what their intentions are or are there not actually profound uh, uh, disagreements driven by the lack of uh, truly fundamental data about whether or not they actually have one. It's not about intentions, it's about the fact that we don't yet have enough data. So you have two questions. One is the state of the program. The state of the program is a data-driven question. They either have so much um, processed uranium or they don't. They either have a workable design for a warhead or they don't. They either have a way of mating it to a bomber or a missile or they don't. But assuming that they get a workable weapon, the question of intentions then becomes paramount. Absolutely. Would they use it against the Israelis? Would they use it against the Saudis? becomes a much more important question than the fact of them having it. And that's not data. I agree with you. We need data. But the problem is if what we got had... away from in the 90s and then in the aughts or whatever we call it last decade, and what we've gotten away from in the, in the age of the war on terrorism, is knowledge, is building knowledge. We used to be a knowledge-building community. During the Cold War, we knew an awful lot about the Soviet Union. Not all of it was right, but we and we built knowledge. We were the fount of knowledge on the Soviet Union. And we got out of the knowledge-building business and into the data business. Walmart's in the data business. We're not. GE is in the data business. JP Morgan is in the data business. We should be in the knowledge business, and we've made it an either-or choice, and that's why I'm fighting this. Because well, we're letting the idea I, of the date overwhelm the need for knowledge. You can try and fight it, but uh, unfortunately that mis, um, misrepresents the continuum that travels along the line well known from data through information, through intelligence, through knowledge. Uh, that continuum is absolutely critical. We'll have no knowledge without the raw fundamental data. Uh, you know, a, a president or a policymaker and a decision maker who um, may hear from the intelligence community, uh, you know, a foreign adversary would take this particular set of actions against us if they had these particular types of weapons. That's well and good, but do they have them or not? And that's a data-driven kind of assessment. Um, so we, well, can, we get we can, to produce intelligence every day, whether or not there's data, and whether or not there's collection. And that's derived from knowledge. You can't tell the president, sorry, sir, no data today. We'll get to you tomorrow. We'll have a really good paper for you then. It's suboptimal, right? Yes, Bob is back. Gentlemen, our time is up. Thank you for a lively discussion. Mark and Lewis, I'm sure this is to be continued. For... <laughs> Probably very soon. <laughs> You're welcome, Thank Bob. For readers of Signal, an article where the two of them face off in print can be found in the October issue. There will be links to this site. Mark Lowenthal, Lewis Shepard, thank you again. Good luck in your endeavors to keep us all safe. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Lewis.